Okay, hello, hello everyone. Um, today's topic is artificial intelligence and its impact on society and some of the key challenges, especially the myth of neutrality when it comes to AI and a fascinating concept called tech chauvinism. And to help me untangle this, I am joined today by Meredith Boussard, who is a data journalist and associate professor. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Um, you've written uh, an amazing book that I've just finished called More Than a Glitch, published by MIT Press, recently published. And this discusses this whole idea of neutrality in AI and why it doesn't exist and why we need to address this. So. Going back, maybe you can give us an overview of what you do when you're not writing books. Great. Well, it's great to meet you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, so as you mentioned, I teach data journalism at NYU. Data journalism is the practice of finding stories in numbers and using numbers to tell stories. Uh, I started my career as a computer scientist. I quit to become a journalist. Uh, and so sometimes what I do is I write code in order to uh, commit acts of investigative reporting. Uh, other times I investigate uh, the code that has been written by other people. So I do algorithmic accountability reporting. And so in the book, I'm doing a com combination of these things. Uh, and then I'm also exploring myths about technology, myths about artificial intelligence. And so I break down complex technical topics like artificial intelligence in plain language mm -hmm. as a way of empowering people to understand today's technology. Very good. Uh, there's so many questions that are in my head now. Um, but maybe we can start with your book because the the fascinating concept that you you talk about is this tech chauvinism and maybe you can explain what that means and the potential impact of this on society and and how we could potentially address that yeah. well the book is called more than a glitch confronting race gender and ability bias in tech and so we kind of have this idea that somehow technological solutions are going to be superior to others. And this itself is a kind of bias that I call techno chauvinism, right? And so what I argue instead is that we should use the right tool for the task. So sometimes the right tool for the task is undoubtedly a computer, right? Like you will pry my smartphone out of my cold dead hands. Uh, but sometimes the right tool for the task is something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on a parent's lap. It's not a competition. One is not inherently better than the other. Uh, we should, again, think about the right tool for the task. Hmm. Very good. So in, in your research, um, you, you look at limitations and biases of algorithms. Um, maybe you can give us a, a, some some examples of of how they actually cause problems in society well the big idea is that we run into problems every single time that we try and use mathematical methods to solve social problems because computers are machines that do math they literally compute Right? So we have wonderful imaginations as human beings. We tend to anthropomorphize things. Uh, this is you know, one of the things that makes us empathetic in the world, but it also trips us up when it comes to thinking about computers. So I tell a story in the book that I think illustrates uh, why, uh, you know, why there's this, this conflict. And the story is about a cookie. Uh, not the kind of cookie you'd have on your computer, you know, that you get pop-ups about, uh, but an actual cookie. Because when I was little uh, and there would be only one cookie left in the cookie jar in my house, my little brother and I would argue about who got the last cookie. And if you were solving this, if you were presented this as a word problem, like in an elementary school textbook, you know, two kids, one cookie, how do you solve this mathematically? The answer is really obvious. 
each child gets 50% of the cookie. And that's an absolutely correct solution. And that is a mathematically fair solution to the problem. But in the real world, what happens when you split a cookie in half is you have a big half and a little half, right? And then my brother and I would fight over who got the big half and the little half. And so if I wanted the big half of the cookie, I would say to my brother something like, all right, you give me the big half of the cookie now and I will let you pick the TV show that we watch after dinner. And my brother would think for a second and he would say, yeah, that sounds fair. And it was, that was a socially fair decision, right? So in the world, mathematically fair decisions and socially fair decisions are not the same. Social fairness and mathematical fairness are not always the same. And so this explains why we run into problems when we try to make socially fair decisions with computers because computers are just doing the mathematical calculations. Uh, so we need to just balance what we are trying to do with computers. We should do the mathy things with computers and the social things. We should not rely exclusively on computers for solutions. Very good. And then the racial issues in algorithms today. Do you have any examples that highlight some of the, the problems? I think one of the really good examples of that comes in facial recognition, because facial recognition is biased based on, uh, on skin color, on skin tone. Uh, facial recognition is generally better at recognizing light skin than dark skin. It's generally better at recognizing men than women. Uh, it generally does not recognize trans and non-binary folks at all. Uh, and then when you do an intersectional analysis of the accuracy, it's best of all at recognizing men with light skin. It's worst of all at recognizing women with dark skin. Mm. Right? So a lot of people will look at uh, you know, this problem with facial recognition and say, oh, well, uh, maybe it's a problem with the training data. And absolutely it is. When we make a machine learning system, AI system, what we do is we take a whole bunch of data, we feed it into the computer and we say, computer, make a model. The computer makes a model. The model shows the mathematical patterns in the data. And then you can use that model to generate new text, generate new images, make decisions, make predictions. Like it's a very powerful model, mm. uh, but it's biased based on the inputs, right? And everybody knows that saying, garbage in, garbage out. So one of the reasons that facial recognition is biased, it does have to do with the quality of the input data. If you put in more pictures of people with light skin or more pictures of men with light skin and fewer pictures of women with dark skin, then yeah, it's going to be better at recognizing the men with lighter skin. So you could make facial recognition more accurate for a range of skin types if you change the training data. Um, but one of the interesting insights from a paper called Gender Shades by Joy Bolomini and Tamika Brew uh, is that when you use facial recognition in certain contexts, it does not uh, promote our aims of social justice. So one of the things that I've come around to realize is that I, we really should not be using facial recognition at all in policing because it is disproportionately weaponized against communities of color, against communities who are already over surveilled and over policed. Uh, so we're not going to achieve justice if we keep using these powerful technologies that work very poorly and have a disparate impact on certain groups of people. Very good. So as technology like AI continues to evolve, what are some of the key ethical considerations that policymakers and developers should keep in mind to ensure responsible and fair use of this technology? Well, there's a very large community that is uh, thinking about and writing about responsible AI governance. Uh, you can look to work by the Algorithmic Justice League, Equal AI, uh, the Public Interest Technology Community, uh, DAIR, uh, C2I2. Uh, there are lots of amazing organizations out there. Uh, 
the NYU Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies uh, is another really great resource. Uh, so you should think about human concerns when you're building artificial intelligence. If you're not building AI, you're just using AI or thinking about purchasing AI solutions for your business, what I would encourage you to do is to be skeptical. Know that people are making really outrageous claims about artificial intelligence. Uh, and those claims are often overblown. AI is, is nifty. Generative AI especially is a lot of fun to play with, uh, but it's not going to transform the entire world. It's gonna change a few things, uh, but it's not the invention of fire. So how can individuals become more informed consumers of technology and really navigate the, the complexity of digital systems? Well, they can read my book, of course. <laughs> One of the things that I do in the beginning of the book, uh, just to put everybody on the same page, is to uh, give a really complete but plain language explanation of how AI works. We talk a lot about artificial intelligence, but when you really sit down and think about it, uh, it's kind of like your car. You can't, like you get in your car, you drive your car, or at least I get in my car and I drive it, but it takes some work to think about, okay, what are all the parts of the engine? What's actually happening in my car while I'm driving it? And I would really prefer not to think about what's going on in my car, but I know that I have to because if I don't, then I'm gonna get ripped off when I go to the mechanic, right? I'm going to overpay or I'm going to, you know, not do a good job of maintenance on my car. So I have to learn some basics about my, how my car works and I have to maintain it. Same thing with computers. We may want to use AI systems without understanding what's going on under the hood, uh, but in order to be responsible participants in our democracy, in order to avoid getting ripped off, in, in order to avoid using biased software. We have to understand a little bit of what's going on under the hood. Very good. So in, in your book, you explore the impact of automation and artificial intelligence on the workforce. Um, how can society prepare for the potential job displacement caused by by such technologies? Well, the first thing that I think people need to know is that generative AI specifically is getting a lot of attention as being a job killer. Uh, and if you are the kind of person who's in a position to replace workers with generative AI, you are in for a nasty shock because generative AI is not as good as you think it is, right? It is, it is mediocre. And mediocre writing is absolutely useful for a lot of situations. Uh, we've had predictive text in email, uh, in writing email for a while now, uh, and generative AI is like a souped up version of this, which is predicting the next word in a sentence. And it seems like it's going to be incredibly useful and flexible for all of these different uh, applications, uh, but it does not have human expertise. And so one of the things that you very quickly realize when you've been using generative AI for a while is that it's kind of boring. It's very neat the first time you do it. And any time that you realize, oh, wait, I can use it to do this new thing, use it to do this new thing, it's really fun, but then the novelty wears off because it just gives you the same thing over and over and over again, the same kind of thing over and over again. And you know, that's all right, but it's going to get really boring. It gets really monotonous. That's not actually what you want to be giving your customers, right? So I uh, think twice before assuming that you can replace human workers with artificial intelligence. Think instead about uh, using AI tools to help people work smarter, uh, help people work better. Uh, and think about AI as, you know, as exactly that, as a helper for humans, as opposed to a replacement for humans. Very good. I'm particularly interested as someone who teaches data journalism, um, what your view is on 
generative AI, especially the the language models that we have, replacing journalists because there's obviously a, an industry that is is being threatened by these tools, and and many many newspapers are already using generative AI for certain parts of journalism. And I guess when it comes to the parts that have a lot of data, that's very tempting then to use AI to create articles and content. What do you think? Uh, I think that people have been talking about computers replacing journalists since the very beginning of computers. And we're still here, mm. you know, storytelling, uh, telling true stories about other people in the world, it never goes out of style. And computers can't really do that. The computers can't find what's new and interesting. They can only regurgitate what they've been told and they can only regurgitate what's been told before. Right? As I said, that gets really boring. Uh, one thing that people often don't realize is that journalists have actually been using AI for a very long time. Uh, we use it uh, in as an investigative tool. Uh, we have been using it to write boring stories, uh, particularly in financial journalism. Uh, so Bloomberg, for example, has been using AI for a very long time to write uh, kind of paragraphs about movement in the financial markets which makes a lot of sense. You can, uh, you know, there are these, these movements that are happening in microseconds or milliseconds and uh, no reporter is going to be able to get in there that quickly and write something and get it through the editorial process. So they use automated methods. Now the automated methods that journalists have been using are kind of like Mad Libs. You remember that children's game Mad Libs where you kind of write a template a uh, template story and then you take out some words and then you plug in new words. So that is the kind of technology that we've had for a long time. It's natural language generation technology. Uh, it's really good for financial reporting. AP has been using it for a really long time to do earnings reports because when you report on corporate earnings, it is basically the same story every single time. It's like, oh, but the earnings are up, the earnings are down. Like, you know, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 it doesn't vary that much. Uh, or sports stories like little league, uh, you know, little league sports scores. Uh, it's a great way of generating uh, a story about something local without having to, uh, you know, put human resources on it. Uh, so we have been using uh, AI for a long time in journalism. We're going to continue to use AI in journalism in ways that uh, are smart. Uh, the organizations who have tried to go over to using generative AI have generally failed, right? So you do, uh, you did hear uh, a lot of hype at the beginning about, oh, so-and-so is, you know, replacing their writers with, uh, with Chad GPT or replacing their writers with generative AI. And all of those organizations pretty quickly discovered that what the generative AI creates is not as high quality as what the journalists were writing. And it needed so much editing in order to be true or interesting that it actually wasn't worth it in the end. Interesting. In your book, you also talk about the importance of data literacy in today's society. What steps can we take to improve data literacy among the, the general public? I really believe in people developing more data literacy and more computational literacy. Uh, the way that I like to start thinking about data is I like to start thinking about it as uh, not something that kind of springs fully formed from the head of Zeus, but uh, as something that is created by people out of a particular social context. Uh, and I wrote about this a little bit in my last book, Artificial Unintelligence. Uh, and the story that I tell is about uh, a friend of mine who teaches kindergarten. And every Monday, he has two of the kindergartners in the class go around the classroom with a clipboard counting pockets, right? So one little kindergartner is the recorder. They make tally marks on the clipboard 
and the other kindergartner is the uh, is the interrogator. And they go up to each kid in the class and they like ask them about their pockets and they count how many pockets they have and they write down and with tally marks how many pockets they have. And it's just the cutest thing I can imagine because kindergartners love talking about pockets and then they talk about what's in their pockets and there's always like some weird you know weird thing like you know complicated wood chips or plastic dinosaur in their pockets and you know they have these nice conversations about it uh and then they put the tally marks up on the uh up on this poster in the side of the room and over time they have a data visualization of how many pockets were in the room on mondays over the course of the year right so the kids are learning literacy uh, numerical literacy uh, through this process. Uh, they don't know their numbers very well in kindergarten, but they can do tally marks, right? And the teacher helps them add up how many pockets are in the room. It's a great exercise, but it's also really good for understanding data because these kindergartners are data collectors. They are collecting data about pockets. They're making a data visualization. And when you think about kindergartners counting pockets, it's very easy to imagine what could go wrong because kindergartners, again, are not numerically literate. Like they're not, they're not literate. They're kindergartners. They're going to make some mistakes and that's fine. It's part of the learning process. That's what we expect. Right. And when you're writing things down on a clipboard, you're going to mess things up. Right. So we tend to think about data as being you know, kind of objective, neutral, unbiased, you know, iconic, uh, empirical. Well, actually, all data comes down to kindergartners with clipboards going around counting things. Right? There are always going to be flaws in the process. We're always going to suffer from things like, how are we asking the question? How are we collecting the data? How are we transmitting the data? How are we representing the data? Right? So getting more data literate is about understanding the human process behind the data and uh, and then getting better at the tools that we use in order to represent the data and then understanding where things can go wrong. Absolutely, and taking away some of the fear people still have when it comes to data and seeing it. I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the earlier we can start with this process, just getting people to understand the importance of data and how you then weave this into meaningful storytelling, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the key challenges we face then in creating a more inclusive and equitable digital future? And how can we address some of those challenges? So I think techno chauvinism is a big obstacle. Uh, when an organization has a techno chauvinist mindset, which a lot of organizations do, uh, what you're going to do then is you're going to just adopt a new computational solution and think that you can get rid of all of the previous uh, previous mechanisms. Right. We see this around forms a lot of the time. Uh, so when I was a kid, uh, you used to have to go to the post office and pick up your printed forms to pay your taxes. And now we file taxes online and it's so much better. And I would never in a million years go back to the system with, you know, picking up the paper forms and filling them up out by hand. But there are still people out there who don't use computers. You know, the digital divide is very real. So we do still need paper forms, right? There are places that don't have internet access, that don't have cell phone coverage. Like the rural, uh, rural urban divide in America is really profound. Uh, even in New York State, where I live, there are plenty of places that are not covered uh, by broadband or by cell service. Uh, so we do still need paper forms. Uh, and so people need to uh, need to realize that just because we add in a new method doesn't mean we can get rid of the old methods. Uh, and this is particularly helpful when we're thinking about designing for accessibility. Right? So one of the things that I read about in the book is a concept that I learned about through my research I uh, called a disability dongle, right? So this is something that uh, 
people in the disability community talk about. And a disability dongle is a design intervention that's well-meaning, but ultimately kind of useless. Uh, so a good example of this is a stair climbing wheelchair. So designers like to uh, create things like stair climbing wheelchairs because you know, they're kind of cool and it's like, oh, all right, let's engineer this really novel, innovative solution. Uh, if you do an online search for a stair climbing wheelchair, you will get a lot of uh, really neat looking pictures. But if you ask somebody who uses a wheelchair, do you want a stair climbing wheelchair? They'll generally say no. Uh, that looks scary, uh, or it does not look like it's going to work, or you know, it looks over-engineered. And they'll say, I would rather have a ramp or an elevator. And you realize, oh, wait, there's already this very simple solution that works really well, and we don't need to add in a lot of extra computational technology. We can just build a ramp, right? So until we've built ramps for everywhere in the world, uh, you know, until we've made the world really accessible, like let's let's not uh, like, let's not over engineer our solutions. Let's use the right tool for the task, uh, and let's think about building inclusive technology. And that generally means, you know, not uh, throwing out earlier uh, earlier methods of access. So in your opinion, what role should education play in fostering critical thinking and digital literacy skills, particular in relation to technology? Well, I'm really enthusiastic about more, uh, you know, more technology education, more computational literacy and data literacy, particularly at the K through 12 level. level. Uh, there has been uh, meaningful intervention in data ethics in computer science education in the past few years. Uh, there has been an ethics requirement for computer science education on the books since about the 1990s. It's just that people didn't really pay attention to it. Universities just didn't really offer uh, computational ethics classes. Uh, so since 2018, uh, since uh, Safia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression came out, uh, since Artificial Unintelligence and Race After Technology and Weapons of Math Destruction came out, uh, I am delighted that more universities are offering data ethics and computational ethics classes. Uh, and we have more professors than ever who are teaching about this material, which is great. Uh, and we do have more uh, knowledge of it at a K through 12 level. Um, there's a movie called Coded Bias uh, that actually I'm in, and it's about uh, Joy Bolomini's work with the Other uh, Justice League and with facial recognition. It's by Shalini Kantaya. It's a great direct documentary. And I know that that's been uh, on the curriculum in a number of high schools. Uh, so we we do have uh, meaningful interventions happening. We could still use more. Uh, another thing that I think we need to do is we need to pay teachers more, pay K through 12 teachers more. Uh, because something that happens is we uh, will have a teacher who starts teaching computer science at K through 12 level, and then they realize that they can make 10 times as much money by going to work for an ed tech firm and they can work not even nearly as hard, and so then they leave, right? So there's brain drain in teaching, the same way that there's brain drain in journalism. You know, it would be great if we would pay journalists more, because uh, we have a big problem with people learning to code in the newsroom and then going to work for big tech because they can make more money. So we need to really think about economic inequality when we think about building the next generation of technologically literate folks. I very much agree, yes. Do you have any personal experiences or anecdotes that you could share with us that um, have shaped your understanding of the intersection between technology and society? One of the, uh, one of the personal stories that I tell in the book is uh, the story of when I got cancer, uh, because I, you know, I'm fine now, I, I should say. Uh, no need to worry about anything. 
Uh, but what happened was I was reading my electronic medical record and I saw a note that said, this scan was read by an AI. And I thought, hey, who wrote this AI? What did it find? Uh, what is its diagnosis of my situation? Uh, did it actually find my cancer? What's going on? I had a lot of questions, but then uh, I got busy and I forgot. Uh, so then after I was healed, I came back to this. And what I did was I learned more about the AI that had read my scans. And I also took an open source AI and ran my scans through it in order to write about the state of the art in AI-based cancer detection. Uh, so we tend to hear about AI-based cancer detection as something that is right around the corner. Uh, it is not. Uh, it is something we've had since at least the 1990s. Uh, it has not worked well enough to replace doctors. Uh, the way it is generally used is that after a doctor uh, reads the scans and files their uh, you know, files their diagnosis or their analysis of the scans, then they would have access to the AI report and the AI report would be a backup to the, uh, to the human doctor. Uh, and I think that's a very appropriate way to use this technology. Uh, some doctors choose to uh, look at the AI's report and, you know, then revisit the scans. Some doctors just find that the AI already valid validates what they already knew and they don't find it very useful, right? So it's a good way of thinking about uh, what kind of AI is going to be useful. It's a good way of thinking about AI as a tool to help people as opposed to a tool to replace people. And it's also useful to think about whether AI is the right solution for every single person, right? Because it's just, it's not the right tool for every task. Very good. So if you think about the, the future that is fast approaching, what about the future are you most scared about when it comes to technologies like AI and, and automation? I wouldn't say I'm scared of technology. Uh, I'm scared mm. of, uh, like the thing that concerns me is uh, when the conversations about AI uh, do not focus on the real harms being experienced by real people at the hands of artificial intelligence nowadays. Mm. Um, AI, you know, all AI that relies on computer vision is generally uh, biased based on skin tone, right? It generally works worse for people with darker skin than lighter skin. And so every single technology that uses computer vision generally has this bias problem. Uh, and so people's enthusiasm for these kinds of technologies uh, is really concerning because if you're trying to say, uh, put in biometric locks on people's uh, apartment doors or office doors, well, people with darker skin are not going to be recognized uh, by the facial recognition as often, and they're not going to be able to get into their apartments or their offices as easily as other people. That seems discriminatory, unnecessary. Well, why not just use a key? And what about the future are you most excited about? Uh, I am really excited about a future in which a lot of people read my book and talk about it. Very good. Yeah. So the, your, your book is called More Than a Glitch and is now available at MIT Press all over the world. So thank you very much, Meredith. That was a, a fascinating conversation. So thank you. For, thank you so for much. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Appreciate it. I, I really loved it. Thank you. Oh, thank you.